I guess this talk is going to be very different, even though it touches upon the notebook feature a little bit as far as the Databricks implementation is concerned. Um, I guess this is more of an overview of what Nitro is planning around um, smart documents, and the notebook application is more incidental, but it's definitely an important showcase of why notebooks are important. Um, okay, so uh, this is just a quick overview of what Nitro does because it's relevant to this particular application. So a long, long time ago, um, there were desktop apps and um, Nitro um, still produces one and it's very good. It's a very good um, replacement for Adobe Acrobat. But um, at the same time, everybody's moving to the cloud. You know, we have Google Docs, Office 365, et cetera, right? So, so that is basically the direction where things are going and the notebook is just one, one example of this. So uh, Nitro switched uh, over to the reactive platform uh, by TypeSafe, so it's all Scala, Aka Play, and, um, and now we have uh, document processing on the cloud. So the benefit of that is that instead of just having the users isolated with their data silos, with their individual documents on, on the individual machines, we have the ability to finally mine this data and, and, and generate solutions that help the users. But to, to, to be able to do that, to have any um, machine learning applied to, to um, uh, documents, we had to get the data first, right? So this, uh, this movement to the cloud was really critical to this um, direction in which Nitro is going right now. So um, currently you have document sharing, uh, e-signing, collaboration, approval, so essentially graphs of documents that move between, um, between um, different stakeholders at the company. And this is all cool. Um, okay, so where was I? So the cloud may be cool, right, for, for sharing PDFs and having a graph of people that need to approve the, PD, the, the you know, some contract or whatever, but essentially this is, this is purely a, a standard engineering problem, right? How do you scale the cloud? But the next, the next thing that, uh, that Nitro would really like to do is to make documents smart. And what does that mean, right? That's, that's just a slogan. So let's be a little bit more specific. So let's say um, you get a non-disclosure agreement. And uh, most of these agreements really look the same, right? There's just a lot of boilerplate. Um, in fact, there's probably some template that somebody wrote many years ago and, and everybody just keeps, keeps copying and pasting and just changing a small specific section. But eventually you probably get to a section of the NDA where you have specifics, right? So accept as specifically authorized herein and you may have some details as to what that actually means. So, and if you get a lot of these documents every day and each one of them is several pages, then you would rather focus your attention on, on what is specific um, as opposed to the boilerplate. So this is just one idea, right? Boilerplate detection, looking at some, some NDA or RFP or whatever and, and, and trying to ignore the, the uh, repeated text and focusing on whatever is specific to that particular uh, legal contract. Language detection. Um, you may wish to sort documents or, or place them in different folders depending on what language they're in. Topic mixture detection. Um, you know, some documents may be about business and pleasure and, and you want to understand, you know, what the, what the mixtures are. Um, uh, document category classification, right? Is it an RFP or an NDA? Um, uh, named entity recognition. So knowing that, you know, this is, this is a proper name, for example. Um, document graph analysis. Um, so understanding who sends this document to whom and who approves it might help, you know, recommend uh, uh, particular actions to the user. Um, uh, related document recommendations, there might be other documents floating around in your organization and, and, and um, if you are actually privy to accessing a particular document but you may not be aware that it exists, the, the system should be able to recommend that to you. Sentiment analysis, right? If you have a very, very long document, you should understand whether, uh, whether a person is approving, disapproving, you know, positive or negative about this particular document. Question answering. So, 
Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen how Watson operates, so this is essentially this principle. And you know, to be fair, any natural language processing algorithm, and for that matter, any machine learning algorithm and any probabilistic algorithm has an error rate around it, right? So it may misclassify, it may assign some element to the wrong cluster. So clearly, it's not a solution that you should be basing your you know, legal decisions on, for example. That said, it's still extremely useful because it can be, it can be simply a tool to help the reader, to guide the reader, right? So, so at the end of the day, you may, ha uh, you may have the overriding um, uh, decision-making power, right, as to whether you're signing this contract or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's your decision not to read certain sections of the document or read them, but if the, the overall um, application allows, um, allows you to focus your attention on particular uh, pieces of information because it, it, it believes that they're more important, well, that could potentially save you time um, and focus you more. I mean, even if you read a whole document that's 40 pages, you may actually miss the uh, relevant sections because you spend so much of your mental energy reading the boilerplate. So it's still good to have some, um, some help from, from uh, NLP, for example. Um, so the thing is, you know, if you're, if you're a cloud platform and if you um, are getting millions of documents from different people, eventually you'll, you'll get into problems, right? Because you're not just a data scientist uh, uh, working with R or Python, you know, on a single node. So eventually you, you'll probably have to uh, start using Spark or Hadoop or, you know, in the, in the olden days it was MPI. So big data is actually not that new, but whatever the technology is, you, you may wish to distribute your, your computation. And not just uh, in an embarrassingly parallel way where you know, each node is processing something different, but you may need to do aggregations, which is where the whole idea of MapReduce comes in. And Spark is just a fancy new way of doing MapReduce in memory, but the, the model, the computational model is essentially the same. So, uh, should we proceed with Hadoop um, and the Java MapReduce API? Well, those are, uh, how many of you have actually played with Hadoop? Cool. So, so you probably know the word count example where you, you know, extend mapper int writable and you know, uh, and so on, and basically write all this ceremony just to get the job started, right? Um, that's not necessarily a Java problem because uh, there were nicer APIs for Hadoop like cascading to deal with this, but nevertheless, this is just so much boilerplate. Um, should you actually go a little bit uh, higher if you're focused on machine learning and, and use Apache Mahout? Um, well, first of all, um, it's, it runs on Hadoop, so, so it's unfortunately pretty slow because Hadoop is great for batch jobs, but unfortunately if you have an iterative algorithm like logistic regression, which takes 100 iteration to, uh, iterations to converge, each of these jobs will basically require you to read from disk, stream the data through the JVM, and then write to disk again, and then for the next iteration you're doing the same old thing. So, so Hadoop was never really meant for iterative computations. Um, and by the way, the Mahout API is pretty crappy. Uh, now they have a nice Scala DSL, which is pretty cool. They, they have a linear algebra DSL, for example, in Scala. But, and, and they're actually moving to Spark, but, but uh, originally it was, it was difficult to use, and first of all, it was very slow. Um, so yeah, Spark to the rescue. Um, I actually have a story from two companies ago where I uh, was running uh, k-means clustering on a particular size data set and it took about an hour and a half, uh, and a half in Mahout and, and Hadoop and the same job took about four minutes on Spark so that tells you, you know, what kind of a speed up you can get uh, anywhere from you know, 10x to 100x. Um, but first of all, from a, from a developer point of view, no ceremony, right? No int writables and MapReduce base extensions and whatnot, right? You just say, okay, it's just a Scala collection. Essentially, I flat map over it and then reduce by key and that's it. Um, so reduce by key is actually the, the main distinction between Scala collections and, and Spark because um, 
Um, th this is essentially a key value um, operation just like um, you would expect on Hadoop, for example. But look at how concise this code is. It's, it's, it could be operating on petabytes of data and you really don't have to think about it. Well, you do if you're implementing a very complex algorithm because you have to know what's local, what's not local, right? Whether you're doing um, partitioning properly, something that, that uh, was also a concern on Hadoop. But at least from a programming point of view, you don't have to think so much about the ceremony. And to be fair to Java 8, um, the Spark API for Java 8 is still a million times better than the uh, 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 Java MapReduce API in Hadoop. Um, and even if you were on Java 7 and you didn't have Lambdas, it would still be way more concise than, than, uh, than Hadoop. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the runtime for many algorithms is, is up to 100x faster for iterative algorithms. That may not be the case for something that's not iterative like um, naive base, but for something like logistic regression where you actually have iterative uh, calculations, uh, uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, but the thing that really is phenomenal about Spark is the fact that it's a whole ecosystem. So let's assume you're in Hadoop land, right? And you write your Java MapReduce um, application then you realize, okay, I want to do relational processing, so I want to cut out some boilerplate and I'm going to use Hive. Then the next problem is graph processing. Okay, I'm going to use GraphX. Then your next problem may be real-time processing, so you're going to go with Storm. And the problem is, first of all, there are 10 different APIs for 10 different problems, but the second problem is you're also not doing data sharing. Your only data sharing is through HDFS. Um, with Spark, you can uh, pre-compute some batch job using Spark, save that data in the cache in memory, and say, OK, now I'm streaming data, um, and I'm, let's say, doing predictions uh, uh, based on the model that was trained in batch. And you, don't, you, you can basically seamlessly switch between a batch application and a streaming application, and it's all in memory, and you don't have to uh, figure out, oh, am I going to export the model using PMML from the bad job and then do scoring you know, using, using, another, uh, using Storm? You know, it's all very straightforward. Um, also, MLlib seems much more complete uh, relative to Mahout in terms of the, the algorithm coverage. And, it's definitely better suited because of the, the, the performance benefit for iterative algorithms. Um, GraphX is also really nicely integrated. So again, you don't have to think, oh, I'm going to use GraphLab or Giraffe or something else for, for, for addressing my graph processing problems. And Spark SQL is definitely much ti uh, more tightly integrated with Spark than, um, than Hive was with, with Hadoop because you can essentially do a projection using, using um, SQL, get your RDD projected or filtered, and then you go back to your regular um, uh, Spark jobs. Um, so basically, as an ecosystem, it's, it's much more tightly integrated, and the interoperability is much nicer. OK, so, so um, the classic example of, of a MapReduce job on Hadoop is a word count, um, but that's kind of boring. So let's some, do something a little bit more interesting. So let's say we're looking at uh, millions of PDFs, and, um, um, and we want to figure out which fonts are, are um, the most popular. That's actually a serious business problem, because if you have thousands of fonts and many of these fonts are proprietary, you have to license them. So if some font occurs you know, uh, 0.0001% of the time and some other font <coughs> occurs 99% of the time, you really want to know which fonts you should license and which fonts you, should, you, you might be willing to substitute. Um, because they're just not very popular, and you, you know that they're close matches. So, this, so there are actual business problems that are a little bit like the word count, but they're a little bit more complex. Um, because, for example, you have to parse the PDF document, which is a non-trivial problem. So let's go through all the PDFs, uh, keep account of the characters rendered um, in each font in each PDF, then aggregate the font counts uh, across um, all documents and sort by frequency. Um, so, right, I already mentioned the business value. So I have both the slides from the Databricks Cloud and I actually have the Databricks Cloud running. So let's try looking at it here. Um, so it's, it's very similar to the Scala notebook. Um, so I'm not really going to go through uh, 
through all of that here, and I'm probably not the best person, but I, I leave it to, to the Databricks folks, and there's some really good presentations on YouTube where, where they, they showcase their product. But um, um, I just wanted to show you how, how straightforward that is, and, and it's very much in, in, in the same um, you know, vein as, as the Scala notebook. So you do your imports here, you know, define some functions to actually process the PDFs because you have to extract the, the metadata from the PDF. So here I'm using Apache PDF box. Um, by the way, for those of you interested in PDFs, you should not use Apache Tika, which is a, a wrapper, because Tika provides a generalization over, PD, over uh, PDFs, HTML, and many other formats. But it provides a much uh, more restricted API for PDFs. So if you want to figure out what fonts you're using, for example, uh, Tika doesn't provide that, whereas PDF box does. And Tika just wraps PDF box, so you, you definitely want to use PDF box if you, if you want to get um, um, uh, access to all the metadata. Now, Spark actually has one cool thing, which is if, you're, if you have legacy Hadoop uh, uh, input formats, um, you can basically reuse them for Spark. So that's one way to, to, to basically integrate all your previous parsers. Um, and in fact, uh, I wrote this um, uh, PDF parsed box writable, which is just like the long writable and int writable and Hadoop and so on. And then there's the PDF box input format, which is just like the text input format on Hadoop, essentially. Um, and um, in the case of, of this application, it just emits case classes. So, so once you get to your RDD, and, and which is the resilient distributed data set, which is the abstraction on um, Spark that essentially is, is the Spark equivalent of a Scala collection, you just get case classes of, of these documents. So, so it's, it's very high level at that point. So you have to uh, get your PDF stripper. That's, that's an Apache uh, PDF box API. You normalize the font names because some of them are just a little bit mangled. So essentially, like with any data science problem, you have a lot of uh, data wrangling. But then again, if you, if, if, if you think about not just data science, but engineering, in many cases, you have to do data wrangling too, like parsing log files or something, right? So, so there's a, a little bit of that ceremony there. Um, and then you finally get font stats. So um, uh, you get the characters for the article. You, know, you can use your, your nice Scala way of doing things. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I really want to go through all the code because you might not be interested in the details of PDF parsing. Um, but um, you basically emit these page stats for each PD document, which is the um, uh, <coughs> PDF box representation of the PDF. Um, so so uh, let's see. Yeah, so in the, in, the page font uh, in the page font stats method, essentially what, what you emit is the font and the count of all the occurrences. Because the way PDFs are encoded is you have the text position where, where a word starts, and you have the font which, this, which um, um, is, is annotated for that uh, text position. And um, you don't have any more annotations to, uh, till the end of the word. And once you move to the next word, you again are told whether it's italic or bold or, and which font it is in. So you basically have to group these text positions by font. And, and, and that's just like group by in, on, a, on a Scala collection. And once you emit that, um, uh, you, you essentially just, just, just do, a, do summation, right? And, and you do that for every document. So that's the embarrassingly parallel part, because you do it separately for each document. So you can just do a map on the cluster, right? That there's no communication between the nodes for this operation, because that can be done separately for each document. So it can be parallelized. But eventually, you have to actually do the aggregations across your collection of all of your PDFs. And this is where the reduce phase comes in. Um, in both the Hadoop and the Spark case. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, one thing to, to note is um, um, we definitely want to cache this original, original uh, data loading. The moment the data leaves HDFS or S3 in the case of Amazon, you basically want to cache this data set if you have enough memory, because that's where, where the, the Spark benefit comes in, right? You can, 
do multiple queries against the same cache data, and they'll be much faster. Um, so basically, I just have this wrapper. Um, it's not particularly interesting. There is my font, the count of, 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 of characters for the document, and the percentage of total when I'm doing the final aggregation across all documents. And um, the main Spark job basically folds over all of these documents. Um, so, so there is a map for each of the document that, that shows the font name and the count um, for that particular document. So you have to do an, a fold over the entire cluster, right, over all of your partial computations from each node. But that's the beauty of Spark, right? It takes care of that for you, and you really don't have to think of in, in low-level terms. It's, it just looks exactly like a Scala collection. Um, and then you can do a sort. Um, the, the good thing is that because we did these partial aggregations, we are actually not doing um, a sort on an enormous data set anymore because there is a limited number of fonts. So the sort is, is actually on, on a small data set at this point. Doing a global sort um, um, on um, both Hadoop and Spark is extremely expensive. Right, because you have a lot of communication to, to sort the data across the nodes, but this, this data set that's submitted is actually very small at this point, so it's really cheap to do. And, um, and since you ha actually have the total of number of characters and the total number of characters on a per font basis, you can actually calculate the percentages of the total um, um, characters across all documents. Um, and uh, and since this is a, a, a notebook type interface, um, you basically have Spark emitting um, results, or basically the, the, the Spark REPL, which is just an enriched ver uh, version of the Scala REPL. And um, OK, so we're getting to, to um, the benefits of, 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 of the no notebook interface here. So once we get this. Um, aggregation, um, actually when you call, uh, let's see, when you do this fold, it, it, it no longer is an RDD, it just becomes a Scala collection. And so I need to uh, parallelize it, convert it to an RDD again, because um, in, in, in the Databricks world, um, uh, basically, you want to register this temporary SQL table that um, allows you to query the data. And so, so this is a very small data set at this point after the aggregation. So you can call parallelize and it just uh, converts it to an RDD. Um, and uh, Databricks provides a way of, of querying your, your temp table just using regular SQL because it's essentially Spark SQL. Um, so so it, it can show you um, these percentages and counts and font names. Um, because that's essentially what you got after the segregation. And um, you, can, you can view the bar charts or whatever you want, right? There's, there's, quite a few, uh, there, there's quite a few graphs that you could do. Um, so, so this is just an overview of, of, of how easy it would be to use Spark. Um, I assume you could probably plug in Spark in a straightforward manner to the Scala notebook itself. And there is a project called Spark Notebook, right, which, uh, which works like that as well. Um, but what's the benefit of all of this, right? So, so you know, many data scientists f feel like, OK, I, I just want to run, run my you know, Python scripts in um, Spider IDE or whatever, or, or PyCharm, for that matter, if they're more engineering oriented. Um, and, uh, and engineers definitely feel like, oh, this is not great because I don't have the IntelliJ level of, of, of you know, static analysis and I'm not really under proper version control. It's not Git. So, so, so what's the benefit of this? Well, there's this whole trend of reproducible research right now in data science. And, and you really want to be able to, for other people to go in and, and, and very quickly figure out what's going on to have not just the code, but the pre-computed results of, of the analysis. Um, and again, it's not a new thing because Mathematica had it in the 90s. But it's becoming more and more popular because 
you know, data scientists are no longer really sitting in, in, in ivory towers, right? They're, they're becoming much, a much more vital part of, of the enterprise, and they want to communicate these results to business people, right? And, and things like, you know, MicroStrategy or, you know, Pentaho, all of these BI dashboards don't really give you machine learning capabilities. So, so what's, what's a nice compromise between, you know, your code sitting in GitHub and, 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 and you working in an ID on the one hand and, and say, a, a, a BI tool, right? While still retaining this flexibility of actually having proper statistical and machine learning algorithms at your disposal. Well, it's, it's an notebook. And, and I think Mathematica got it right in the 90s and you know, with IPython notebook and the, the Scala notebook and, and the Databricks cloud, it, it, it's, it's just becoming very popular because it, it really has the power of communicating the results that the data scientists produce to, uh, to a wider audience. And, um, and I, basically, most of these notebooks have a feature where you, know, you can actually embed Markdown and you can embed LaTeX and, 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 and images. So, so it's really kind of a multimedia setting, right? Because uh, depending on your problem, you may use different languages, right? So whether it's SQL or Markdown or whatever, it should all be sort of seamlessly integrated. And um, I, I, I really don't think that I'm the right person to talk about the Databricks Cloud in detail because they're experts who actually built the platform. But I, I just wanted to show how, how it could be potentially useful for, for the, the big data science questions that remain. Um, so I guess that's about it. So the, the Databricks Cloud itself was demoed at Spark Summit last year. Ali Gotzi is the project lead, and he basically uh, agreed to uh, give a talk at SF Skull about the Databricks Cloud architecture itself uh, in one of the future meetups pretty soon, right? So basically, they are actually improving the whole product line, and uh, they want to share it with us. They just uh, didn't have the time to join us for this meetup, but Ali is a great guy, so he will come and share the roadmap and they're actually integrating all kinds of features so this will change you know in the future very 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 yeah, but one thing that I definitely found nice in, in the Databricks Cloud is the ability to embed HTML directly. So, for example, and I know that probably some people are going to say, okay, what about cross site scripting or whatever? But if this is an internal research tool and this is not a you know, outward facing website, but it's a way to communicate stuff internally, I think it's actually very powerful because what if you know, the Databricks Cloud doesn't have some crazy D3JS visualization that you want and you want it now, right? You know, maybe maybe uh, maybe there there should be an option to disable it, but I think it's actually very cool in in my opinion because you can just integrate your new JavaScript library right away, and uh, and uh, you know and and to embed any other features you really want. So um, obviously, a, any company has a limited bandwidth at addressing every customer request, so the ability to actually customize it yourself is pretty powerful. But I guess that's sort of the general perspective of the notebooks, right? That the, the same is the case with the, the IPython notebook. You can, you can uh, customize it pretty easily. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I generally, I'm, I, I think it's a really good way of communicating the results. Um, I would, rather, I would much rather sit in IntelliJ for, for like basically developing the algorithm because the ID helps me, but you, I still want to communicate the results, and this is the most powerful way to do this. So, um, Is there any kind of feature to have more of that ID functionality in the Databricks style set? That would be a question to Databricks. No, I just want to continue it. Yeah, but yeah, well, I think the autocomplete, for example, that, this, that the um, Scala notebook had is already very helpful. Um, I'm not sure what the general plans are. I think it's a little bit complicated when you actually have a REPL because you know, the REPL has to essentially compile your code and then do a class loading. And you know, it's not Python, right? So you're not just evaluating on the fly. It's not going to be very quick because you have to invoke the Scala compiler to figure out what's going on. And that can be pretty expensive. Um, 
unless there is a way to make the REPL basically work the way the way the, the fast Scala compiler works. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I. I mean, it's a question to Databricks. I'm sure they're, they 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 already request uh, got that feature request from other people. I, I think that would be great. Um, yeah. I. I've, I don't know. So I have a question for you. Um, you showed us two uh, types of technology for smart documents, the Nitro technology, the um, Databricks technology. Um, what does the Databricks technology mean for Nitro's um, business proposition? I mean, if these are the smart documents of the future, how would they, you incorporate them into Nitro? Right. Well, so. So the premise of all these notebook interfaces is just to enable a fast and convenient communication of the research results, right? And the research results never really go outside. They're internal, right? Because if you, for example, figure out, oh, OK, I know how to classify these documents better, or I figured out how to model topics appropriately, right? This is the kind of stuff that you share internally uh, with your platform team, for example, as a data scientist, so that they could incorporate it into your software as a service platform. But this is not really visible externally, right? So, so. Why not? Well, it could be if you're basically willing to share your intellectual property with everybody else. Um, that's different from open sourcing your code base, I think, because that's where the secret sauce is. Like, if you have tens of millions of documents, it's not necessarily the, the value is not necessarily in your source code, which you could open source, but with the fact that nobody has access to that many documents, so you could actually learn, uh, so you could actually let your machine learning algorithm learn more about how documents operate. And, um, and of course, you know, just, just being able to ask the right questions, featureizing your data appropriately. So, so this is the kind of stuff that is, that is usually part of the, any company's IP, I would assume. And uh, so that's why it's more, more internally facing, right? I can actually add to this. Uh, so actually, I think we can learn a lot from Scala Notebook and AWS Cloud, because some of the uh, products we think about this reactor. So we are reactor. Right? Like this is you know, our t-shirt that actually reflects, a, you know, initially a type size tag, but it also re reflects the nature of the documents themselves. Right? So if you think of the PDF, it's a static document which is kind of immutable, but you know, when you need to correct an offer letter or a contract, you actually interact with it. So ideally, we want to have this fluid interface where illegal contracts some, suddenly becomes mutable. Suddenly, can, you, know, you can click on, on a piece of it and suddenly can mutate. For instance, it's a one-way NDA, and say, you know, our recommender system actually says, a lot of people ask one-way NDAs to be changed to two-way NDAs, right? And it will actually offer this option to you, and you actually should, you know, see a drop-down menu. Should you should update it on the fly, so it will be a reactive document. So the JavaScript is unwieldy, right? So let's have a scale developer on the prototype how it works uh, in the UI, and kind of we have been full stack overflow developer, right? I need to do that, uh, and 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 uh, we want to have an ability, right? To, to this fluid UI should be reactive. We just want to learn from Scala Notebook, right? They use a lot of tricks. It has a lot of experience actually doing exactly. You know, you have cells. You can easily see how you break the documents of this kind of cells. So we definitely want to learn from this, right? It's, yeah, yeah. And this technology inspires what we want to do in the UI. We probably want to do it in Scala JS. We want to stay in the Scala scope. But the behaviors are certainly the kind of, you know, the behaviors are what we want to, to use. Uh, so I would say it goes a lot, you know, it's goes a lot, like it's the pudding yourself, right? Like, if we have this dynamic environment for our documents internally, you know, and we might as well learn how to do this. Right, so, so if you distinguish the findings from the data science effort, which are probably the company's IP, from the inspiration that we can get from these interfaces, then, then yeah, that's, that totally makes sense. Any other questions? Well, so going back to the font example, 
we want that, right? Because we're licensing funds from other people. So if somebody, if, if you use one particular font, one in a million documents, you may not w be willing to actually license it because it's a waste of time and money, right? Um, and you may be willing to substitute it, but if some font is very popular, then you have to be as true to the original as possible. So in that case, it would perf make perfect sense. So that's business, internal business optimization. Um, with regard to things like, um, like you know, finding boilerplate in documents, you know, I, I, I have to read so many contracts, right? And, and I don't even know where to start because like the classic example of the Apple license agreement, right? Everybody clicks agree because they don't have time to read this stuff. But if, and, and, and again, you know, this is not a replacement for human intelligence because um, every um, natural language processing algorithm has an error rate attached to it, so it's, it will never classify, you know, with a hundred. It won't. It will never have 100% recall and, and precision. Um, but if it at least helps you decide that, you know, maybe this is the section you should pay a, attention to. Um, you you may choose to read the whole thing anyway, but if if it focuses your attention, that definitely is a time saver, or at least. Or at least if you imagine reading 40 pages of, of legal stuff, and then you basically, by the time you actually get to the specific section that you should pay attention to because it's not boilerplate, your attention span is already reduced because you've read all this boilerplate, you may actually miss it even if you decide to read the whole thing. So having some kind of um, um, uh, you know, intelligence in the document should really help in that case. Um, so, okay, so, so other examples. Let's, let's just not look at PDFs for a second. Let's just look at something like Google Docs. Uh, sorry, not Google Docs, Google News, right? So, so if you look at Google News, it actually shows you the mo most important news of the day, but if you click on a particular piece of news, it finds all the related pieces of news. That's document clustering. Nobody actually goes and curates that, right? Yahoo tried curation in 1995 or whenever, and, and that was a lot of work, right? So, so, and, so basically, this grouping of, of documents is, uh, is, is done using a clustering algorithm. Um, uh, you know, obviously, from a completely different domain, spam filtering, right? This is a, usually, a, even in the 90s, it was a naive base classifier. It was, it was a, a, now it's probably an SVM. These are all machine learning algorithms. So, so, so some kind of intelligence and text processing has been around for a while. And, um, and you know, there, there are tons of applications for business documents that have not been tapped by Google or Microsoft so far. Um, they do collaborative editing online, but they don't really aid the reader in any way. Um, Gmail is a great example too, right? Because it, it groups it, it, it groups your um, your threads, and it um, you know has pretty intelligent search capabilities. So so if you care about making your email processing more efficient, and you're still reading the email, you're not just letting the system make decisions for you. You know there was this um, uh, April Fool's Day. Uh, uh, Gmail video where they said, you know, they would actually do intelligent auto re replies. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we're not there yet and I don't think we will be, but um, anytime soon. But, but if, if, if you expect intelligence out of your email system or, um, you know, many, or, or you, for example, have, you know, Google Translate. Yes, that translation is very crude, but it can still help you understand a document in a language you don't know. Um, uh, if we expect that kind of intelligence from other documents and, and sources of text that we're consuming, then, then surely there are similar business cases for, for the documents that actually matter because you're signing a $100 million deal and you have to read a document, right? Or, or you know, you're just flooded with paperwork and you have to figure out how do I optimize my time use. So. I don't have all the answers that, you know, that this whole office just got started recently. So, so we're actually looking at these cases, but, but uh, you know, there, there are definitely lots of opportunities like that. You guys can help, come join us and help us build this, right? 
or actually provide suggestions if you have a problem that you're dealing with, and we'll try to implement it.